This is Negotiate X TV. Hello and welcome to the Negotiate X podcast. Really excited for today's episode. Aram, do you want to go ahead and take it away? I will. Today, folks, we are joined by Michael Phillips, the founder and head of Phillips Consulting, a niche management consulting firm specializing in commercial negotiations for public and private sector companies. For nearly 30 years, Mike has led negotiations for organizations as diverse as the NHS, local councils, and global manufacturing corporations. He's negotiated contracts for for everything from nursing home placements to cinema screens, orthopedic implants to sewage pumps, and liquid helium to truck leases. That is a wonderful variety of different negotiations. I hope we can get into a few of those. Uh, And that has been with clients in the UK, throughout Europe, USA, Asia, and Mike has traveled the globe for decades, practicing and coaching the science of negotiation. Mike has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, which is an obvious lead uh, into the (laughs) negotiation field uh, from Brunel University in London. He published his book, The Naked Negotiator, How to Negotiate the Salary You Deserve. I know we're going to have some fun getting into that. And he currently resides in England. Mike, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, it's great to be here, guys. And thanks for inviting me to talk with you. Absolutely. So, Mike, again, thank you so much for being here today. Perhaps we could start off by talking a bit about the 30-year journey in negotiations and how you got here. As Aram had said, it's obviously that you, or it's obvious that you got here from your mechanical engineering degree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So as Aram said, I, I, I did graduate with mechanical engineering. Um, the, the sort of the way I got to commercial procurement was via manufacturing industry. So as an engineer, I tended to work after graduating in uh, manufacturing companies. Um, and uh, almost kind of by accident, I, w- I was either working directly in or responsible for procurement. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed that work, but I, I wanted to work for myself. Um, so my wife and I discussed, you know, a lot of business ideas. But to be honest, we were really struggling up to, to come up with the idea, if you know what I mean. Um, But because of my procurement responsibilities, I was involved a lot in negotiation and I found I was good at it. Um, So this sort of gave me the germ of a business idea, which was to help organizations with their negotiating. Um, I mean, at the time, we weren't sure about this because it was a big step. You know, I was in my employment. I was getting a good salary. We had three children under the age of five and a mortgage to pay. Um, then something happened which sort of pushed me into action. Um, I had a, a bit of a disagreement with my boss, who was the CEO of my employer, employer at the time. We'd had quite an animated debate about a particular issue. Um, afterwards, he called me into his office and he said, Mike, if you ever speak to me like that again, you're fired. You know, and I was, I, I, to say the least, I was pretty gobsmacked. Um, <laughs> I felt, uh, and I still feel this to, to this day, that I was assertive in our discussion, but in yeah. no way aggressive or discourteous. And uh, maybe we can talk a bit more about the difference between aggression and assertiveness later. But he obviously yeah. evidently wasn't happy with assertiveness. He wanted submissiveness, if you like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I don't really feel you could run a successful organization with a management team uh, of people who are fearful of saying what they think it, it was right. Um, and I remember it was, it, was a, it was a Friday that this happened, um, and I told him, look, you know, I, I, I really have a problem with what you're saying. I need to think about this over the weekend. So he was okay with that. Um, and so over the weekend, my wife and I had a lot of discussions um, about the negotiating business idea that was sort of in the back of our minds anyway. Um, and decided that we, we should go for it. Wow. So on, on, on the Monday morning, I went to work as usual. I went straight to my boss's office. I shook his hand, wished him well, but I told him I, I couldn't work for him any longer. Um, so I got in the car, came back home. So by, by 10 o'clock, I was back home. I, I sat at my desk, which at the time was in the corner of the living room. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I thought now, where do I start? <laughs> you know, it was probably not the best way to start a consulting business. 
know, it, it's it's bold. It's definitely bold. <laughs> it might have been better to line up one or two clients before quitting my job. But you know, there you go. That was the that, that was the boldness of, of you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely bold, Mike. <laughs> Just to put a pin in it, we will come back to this discussion around assertive versus aggressive because mm-hmm. I think that is we need to look, talk about that. But wow, what a what a what a great way. So hold on before before you go on to the next question though. Oh, how how long has that been since since you did that? And you're sitting at the desk, and now now here you are. So that's nearly thirty years ago. Actually, it's it's wow. twenty nine years um, on the fourth of July, which for for you US people seems a great day to start a business independent. <laughs> <laughs> we do like that day. That's right. <laughs> so so yeah. So that was twenty nine years ago. I'm now in the thirtieth year, um, uh, and yeah, I've developed a, a, a sort of. A, a, a niche or a niche, as we we, we say, is, is mostly not exclusively working for manufacturing companies, okay. but with a, with a turnover of between maybe a, a ten million dollars and maybe a hundred million dollars. Um, if if the company's smaller than that, the deals are not really big enough to make it worthwhile. Um, if the company's larger than a hundred million, they tend to think they don't need outside help, help although yeah. they're frequently wrong about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of niche that, that I'm in. And, and as you mentioned in the intro, Aaron, I also have done work for, for the NHS in, in Britain, which is kind of very different because the culture is very different than a commercial company, but nevertheless, still fun and interesting. Can you say, sorry, and I don't want to get us off. I know we're going to get into your book and salary negotiations. Can you tell us just a little bit more about the nature of the negotiations that you that you assist with with NHS? Yeah, so with the NHS, typically the, the, the structure of the NHS is it's made up of multiple trusts around the country. So like a, a trust might be as small as a single hospital, but it might be two or three hospitals. Um, and although it's changed recently in a little bit in recent years, generally the trusts do their own procurement. Um, and well, between you and me and this podcast, they're not very good at it. <laughs> um, yeah. and, uh, so I, I have been involved in lots of different areas, but an area that I've tended to specialize in, um, is orthopedic implants, hips, okay. knees, you know, that, that sort of thing. And the important thing about this is it's quite interesting from a negotiating point of view, because the surgeons tend to rule the roost in terms yeah. of what they want. You know, they, they might have a particular, uh, you know, manufacturer, they fa- favor, you know, strike or Depew or whatever. Um, and that they want to use that and they don't want to use anyone else. Now, of course, if the yeah. rep from that company knows that their end user won't move from their product, you know, you haven't really got much leverage with them. So right. I have to do a lot of work with the surgeons, first of all, reassuring them that I'm not going to tell them what implant to use. They're the experts on that. I'm not going to do that. But, right. you know, I'm the expert on negotiating and they need to help me. And the way they can help me is to imply at least to, to the, the companies when we meet them that they are willing to move. Even if they're not willing, they need to imply that they're willing. And then that opens up just a little bit of a, a leverage. So we only need to create a little bit of doubt in the supplier's mind that we might move. And then the prices will come down. Um, and some some surgeons... They don't really get on board with it, but some really love it. They really enjoy the commercial side of it. And and uh, I don't know if you, you – you have The Apprentice in the UK, the TV program, do you, where, where they, they yeah. have all these yeah. wannabes and they, they all have given these tasks, but uh, but if they get it wrong, they said, like, you're fired sort of thing. I yeah. remember a <laughs> time I was working with an NHS trust and I had the surgeon with me, backing me up, you know, giving me the – his input on it. And he seemed to really get into this idea that he wanted, he, we needed to unsettle the supplier. And at one point it's sort of just copying the apprentice. He turned around to the guy and said, you're fired, you know, with great. <laughs> <laughs> he was only pulling his leg, but it was, it was quite funny. <laughs> anyway, we've got, we've got a big cost reduction, you know, like I can't remember, but, you know, 25, 30%, a big, a big cost now. Yeah. Well, that's great. And I think that we're going to definitely keep diving into a little bit more about this in uh, in a, the top of the hour, but first we're going to talk about your book called the neck and negotiator. And I don't like to assume anything. So please help us understand what this book is about. Sure. <laughs> so, so, you know, as I've just said, I, I, my expertise has been built up in, 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 in organizations. Uh, and so it's, it's around that organizational piece. 
But really, negotiating is important for individuals as well. Um, and so that's where the germ of the book came from, is how can, how can I use my expertise to help individuals? Um, so the book is about negotiating a salary increase, as the subtitle says. Um, and this, of course, is something that you know many of us will, will face over the course of our career. Yeah. But although it uses salary negoti negotiation as a case study, that the theory and practice in the book, of course, can be applied to any negotiation. Um, sure. But so importantly, the idea behind this book is that it presents robust negotiating theory, but in an accessible, engaging and entertaining way. So it's a book suitable not just for negotiating nerds like us, but also for no negotiation novices. So yeah. I've, written it in, I've written it in the form of a short story. So the, the plot follows a young woman manager, Ellen, who loves her job, who's good at it, but feels she deserves better compensation. But she just doesn't know how to go about asking for it. Um, and she happens across an aged, rather eccentric negotiation expert, the naked negotiator, and he takes her on a journey that I hope educates, excites, and terrifies in equal measure. Um, why does he call himself the, uh, the naked negotiator? Well, the other day I listened to your excellent discussion that you had with John Deffenbach, and I really enjoyed yeah. it. And I noticed that John said that every negotiation is different. And I agree with him, but there's also a sense in which every negotiation is the same. Because when you strip away the specifics, the things that make the particular negotiation you're in unique – you're left with the sort of basic negotiation theory. And that always applies. And it's always applicable because we're human. Um, and, yeah. and so when you strip away the, the specifics of the negotiation, you're left with that negotiation theory framework, what you might call the naked negotiation. So hence the name. That's a point that I make with groups that, that we do training with too, um, Mike, which is while the context is unique, the challenges, right? The things that then show up, uh, what, the way you do, right, are, are very much the same, right? In terms of what, what, you know, what's going to happen when this goes wrong, or or if we don't get a deal, or what makes this conversation challenging. It's those things are often often the same. So, like, certainly like that point. Um, you know, it, what part of I appreciate that your kind of hero in the story, Ellen, who's right, is a woman. Um, you know, I'm wondering about your motivation here. You have three daughters of your own. I have four daughters. I yes. really appreciate uh, how much, you know, in terms of helping women specifically negotiate more constructively on their own behalf, how important is that to you? And, and, and can you elaborate maybe on unique challenges that women um, face uh, in, in how you try to help them be more constructive in, in negotiating? Sure. Well, you know, my my wife and three daughters are all of working age, so they all, you know, are, are, are potentially experiencing this. And so I did consult with them a lot in the writing of the book. I was keen to try and make sure that, that Ellen, the lead character, was sort of credible and understandable from a female perspective. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the first thing to say is that um, – you know, when we're talking about differences, there's as much difference within gender as, as, as across them. You know, you know, over the years, I've met some really powerful female negotiators and, and really weak male negotiators. But having said that, you know, studies do show that in this particular context of salary negotiation, women do tend to be more reticent about asking for, for an increase. Um, and when they do ask, they tend to get a, a lower increase. So, you know, I, I, I was, I, I did have women in my mind when I was, when I was writing this book, you know, wanting to help, helping uh, women, you know, and obviously we've got the gender pay gap, which everybody wants to try and, um, try and reduce. So, Absolutely. so yeah, so that's, that's obviously important. I mean, as to why women are more reticent, you know, I, I you know, there are a number of theories. It, it could be quite simply that men uh, tend to, judge their self-worth a bit more by by their salary level maybe you know even in these enlightened times you've still got the idea that the man should be the breadwinner so that may be a reason why men tend to be a bit more forward 
about asking for a salary and women maybe less so. Yeah, I've also heard, and you can correct me uh, where I'm wrong on this, please, that um, sometimes it's it's what women ask for versus what men ask for. So men tend to ask more specifically for the number and women will often uh, ask for some of the more tangible or um, uh, the, the, the more side things, right? So the, the flexibility around maybe work schedules or, or, or other, other things that can come up in a negotiation. Do, do you see any of that in, in your work and research? Yeah, I think that's true. I, I think that's true. I, I, I would often say, you know, if I was an advi- advising a woman on this, is to, to go for salary first because obviously money in your bank accounts gives, gives you, you know, the maximum amount of flexibility. But having said that, those other, if you like, non-salary things can be, yeah. can be valuable. But I think what you need to do is you need to value them in your own head. Um, right. You know, as if, you know, if, you know, if, if somebody offered me a job that had this lower salary but had this benefit, would I take it? And then that gives you a feeling of what does that really mean to you? Uh, how, how do you value it? And then, then you're in a position to, to trade in the negotiation. Right. So, you know, you're talking a little bit, um, the valuing stuff. I assume some of this happens in preparation. Um, is you, in your book, what, what do you talk about in terms of strategies or approaches that people can use to better prepare for a pay raise no negotiation? And how does, you know, like, kind of gathering relevant data and information um, kind of support that preparation piece? What data should they be focusing on as they prepare? Well, the first thing to say, and this is very much emphasized in the book, that preparation is everything. You know, it, it, this 90% of your success in this will be based on what you do before you've spoken a word with your boss. So you really need to be assiduous, extremely diligent in gathering the data to support your case. I think it's really helpful to, to for example, make use of charts rather than um, that more impact than a bland uh, table of numbers. Um, you also might want to think about um, uh, rehearsing what, you, what you're going to do, you know, role play. Um, I've often done this when I, in, in recruitment. And to be fair, some people hate it, but it's excellent preparation. <laughs> it's excellent yeah. preparation for a negotiation. Some people say, well, I'm not an actor. Well, you know, it, it, maybe not, but... It's it's important to get the, you, you know your mind around um, what what you're going to be uh, covering. So you really need to do your market research. Um, you can go to you know websites like payscale.com, um, job sites in the UK. We have Indeed, Monster, and Read. I don't know you might, you might have the same yep. in, in the US. Um, you obviously need to be as specific as you can. Try and make sure you get to your industry, your role your level of experience. Um, but it really is it put in the time, make sure you're well prepared before you go and meet with your boss. That's the really important thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we talked a lot about the rehearsals aspect of thing. I think that that's so important because it provides the flexibility nine times out of 10, the conversation is probably not going to go anywhere like you rehearsed, but at least you've thought through some ideas. You at least have thought through some different ways that this could go and you're at least a little bit more prepared so they can go a little bit more smoothly. So, yeah, I think that that's definitely important. Yeah. yeah. So, so what are some effective communication techniques that Ellen can use during a pay raise negotiation to increase her chances of success? Yeah, I mean, I just mentioned charts again. I'm a big believer that a picture uh, paints a thousand words. So just make sure you, you think about that. Another one is use the language your boss uses use the type of language your boss uses right so if your boss is a kind of empathetic type you know use empathetic language but if your boss is a very straightforward business-like sort of person you know imitate that sort of language it's a kind of analogous to you know how we say sometimes when you meet with people mirror their body language um mirror their actual language as well in the discussion Take care not to overdo it, <laughs> but, but, you know, you, you basically yeah. use the same type of language. And, and that, that concept that you just shared, I think that applies even beyond, because as you were saying, right, this book is really written, while it's written, focused on salary, it's broader application. So sure. anytime we're trying to influence um, a, a, a boss or senior manager, maybe it's even on the direction a project should go or, or the scale or scope of something, whatever it might be, um, speaking to their language and knowing what 
their concerns are and so forth, speaking into that can be really helpful. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, we touched on this a little bit earlier. I would say be assertive but not aggressive. Now, this is really important. Um, yeah. As you say, generally in negotiation, but especially in this case. Now, what does that mean? I mean, I would kind of summarize it is that at all times be warm towards the person, you know, be, be polite, be courteous, you know, be nice for want of a better word, but be tough on the issue. You know, the, 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 we're discussing this is important to me. You know, we, we've got to get this right. So it's warm towards the person, but tough on the issue. So that's really yeah. um, being assertive. And so aggressive, which is interesting, because let, let's just stay, stay on this point for one more point. How much is aggressiveness in the eyes of the beholder, right? So I'm trying to be assertive. I, I am trying to be warm and at the same time strong on, on what the issue may be here. And and you're taking that as my boss and you're saying, man, Aram is being really aggressive with this, okay? I mean, so how, how do you manage that? Well, you know, this is another another area where there's a bit of a difference between men and women, isn't there? You know, I, I, I mean, I've, I've been married 36 years and I can remember over the years from time to time, my wife would turn around to me and speak, stop being so aggressive. And I'm like, what? You know, it's, I'm just not registering that I'm being aggressive at all. Um, so, uh, but again, I guess it's not only about the differences between the gender, it's also different characters as well. Yeah. So I, I guess there's a bit of experience there, kind of getting to know people, understanding what sort of character there are. It's similar to what I was saying about you know, the use of language. You know, what type of person is this? Um, and if, if you've got a more, you know, for want of a better phrase, touchy-feely person, you kind of maybe need to tone it down a little bit. If you've got a more direct business sort of put like person, you can be direct. And normally when I'm in a business negotiation, I am pretty direct, but I'm, you know, very careful not to be aggressive. And of course, the problem with aggression is that you can, you can inflame the other person, the other party's um, competitive spirit. And then once you inflame that, they're not thinking about the issue that you want them to think about anymore. They're thinking about how they can defeat you. So, yeah. so that's why there's a really important difference between aggression and assertiveness, but you've got to have assertiveness because the, the other party really must understand that you mean business and this is serious. You, you talked about, um, you know, an employee needs to determine their, their fair value, their worth, establish a realistic range, uh, the, the importance of going to data. And, you know, there's, there's so much information now that's, that's made of it made out there. Yeah. In addition to that, um, how does one, appropriately put value that may be less tangible than a dollar sign or a pound sign, I guess, whatever the, you know, but um, to, to other, other things that you may want to bring in that are going to be important access to senior leadership, the ability to travel or, or do training or control over my work schedule or whatever it might be. How, how do you coach somebody to do that as well uh, during their preparation phase? Well, I think, Aaron, this is, this, these sorts of things are going to be fairly subjective, aren't they? Because it, it, there's a bit of it, what does it mean to you? How important yeah. is it to you? Um, and I think, yeah, I think, you know, you've got to you play the thought experiment, as I say, that, you know, if, some, if somebody else offered me the job that had this less money but it had this benefit, would I want to take it? So that, in, a, in your own mind, can create... Um, a value to it. Um, I guess you might want to think about what the value is to the company as well. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it, if it was a better healthcare cover or whatever, you, you may want to try and find out, you know, what, what that cost is. That may help you make a judgment about the likelihood of them agreeing to it. Um, but I think it's pretty sub, pretty subjective. I mean, uh, you, some things could be more easier to quantify. So, for example, childcare. You know, if there was opportunity for childcare, you, you, you can work out, you know, what it's going to cost to have that funded elsewhere versus what maybe your employer would ask. Which is, again, that's nice because that gets us back to an apples to apples comparison, yeah. which I heard you even around standards t saying that's important, right? To know my role, my industry, my level of experience as I determine a range for compensation in whatever form it needs to be apples to apples. And that's, I hear, I kind of hear that too, as I think more broadly about what we might negotiate need to, needing to do the same thing. Yeah, I think so. Because at the end of the day, part of this in doing your research, um, 
uh, and the naked negotiator talks to Ellen about this, is you've got to believe it yourself. You've got to believe it yourself. You've got to do, you may do the research and find out that actually you're already well paid. Now that's going to be more tricky and, and uh, you know, not impossible, but more tricky. But assuming you do your research and you can make the case to yourself that you deserve more. And, and after that's what we normally we normally go into a, 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 a negotiation about we, we think we deserve more, then you've got to convince yourself. You need to believe it yourself. And then if you believe it yourself, you've got a much better chance of convincing your boss about it. But your boss is the person holding the purse strings, and uh, you know he or she needs to be convinced that they're not going to just do it because you're a lovely person or you feel <laughs> that you deserve more money. You have to make the case. You have to demonstrate. Yeah, I like that. So kind of... Building on that question, I'm kind of flipping it a little bit. So my other job is running my company, Grayline Media, and we're a website design digital marketing agency. We have bootstrapped, we're, we're basically in the bootstrapped growth phase, as I like to call it, where I'm not in a position as the employer to give raises to my team, despite them all being very deserving of it. So how do I have this difficult conversation where I want to acknowledge all of their hard work and everything that they've done, but not necessarily in a position where I can give them a pay raise. Like what advice would you have for me from the other side of the coin? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I'll answer that question, but just, it just sparked an interesting point. I just want to share with you is that, you know, when I, when I wrote this book, I assumed, because obviously I've got lots of contacts, contacts at MD CEO level because of the work I do. And I kind of assumed that most of the people at that level really wouldn't be interested in this book because they don't want their employees to have it, you know. <laughs> but funny enough, one of one of what the contacts I had, um, he read it and he loved the book. Um, and he told me a couple of weeks later that one of his employees had come to him and asked for a pay rise. And he said to him, go away and read this book. Read this book and then come back to me and make your case. Uh, and yeah. he did that and he got, you know, a significant pay rise. But I thought it was interesting that, you know, the, the MD was wanting the, 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 the guy to make the case, um, right. which is, which was great. Which I love, by the way, because I, I often say I love work. I love negotiating with somebody who's equally well prepared. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Who's clear in their mind about what their interests are, who's thought about some different ways to create this, who's, who's well armed with, you know, objective criteria and so forth, right? I, I like negotiating with that person. Yeah. So I love the fact that that's what they told them to go do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so to answer your question. And Nolan, from the other side, you know, what about when, when, when you, you, you're not in, you haven't got the ability to do that? Um, now, you know, I do, I do say to people when we're talking about um, salary increases, it, on one side of the coin, um, it, it, the, the, the financial health of the company, it, it, to put it in the, in the brutal sense, is not your problem. You know, you are selling a service to your employer. You know, these are my skills. You buy my skills off me. You have to pay the market rate. That's one side of the coin. Now, having said that, you know, there is a case to be made to say, well, okay, look, we're in a growth phase. You know, we want you to be part of this. We want you to be part of this, but it's going to, you know, Rome isn't built on a day. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I want you to be paid the market rate. And, you know, when that's possible, we're going to do that. But, you know, that once upon a time, you know, there must have been employees, I don't know, at Apple who have been at that point, you know, thinking, you know, I don't know, it's, 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 it's you know, not, not going to happen. I'm not getting paid. What I want. But, yeah, so I guess from your point of view, Nolan, you've got to be selling the vision, haven't you? The vision of yep. what's happening to the business. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if you can do that, then people will make a personal judgment. Well, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to back this. And ultimately, if they don't back it, then, you know, they'll go somewhere else and, and get what they think they are worth. Yeah, sure. No, that's great advice. And this reminds me, by the way, and just going a little further, it reminds me of like, as my students, uh, I teach, a, I teach MBA students who, who tend to go off. Some go off into very mature industries where, as you were saying, for, for this job, with your experience, this is where we typically start. It may still be a range based on a few different things. And then there's folks who go, are going off to startups um, where there is very little data available. Yeah. Um, you're, you know, te very small teams, you know, companies tend to large people. Um, and, and that's a much harder place for them to, to think through. D does your advice at all change or vary as you, as you think about where the role or the industry that somebody's going in in terms of how you tell the 
somebody to kind of have that conversation? Well, you know, from a negotiating perspective, you know, one thing I, you know, I do say is that you have to have a threat because if, if, if you don't have a threat, then, you know, why would the other party concede anything? So in the salary negotiation context, even when you're, you know, with a startup, you have to decide for yourself you know, whether you're going to back this startup and that effectively by agreeing to take a lower than market rate salary, in a sense, you're investing in, in, in the company right. uh, for the long term. You're back in the company. Um, but if you if you if you're if you're not there, if you're not at that point, then it, bluntly, you've got to say, well, you know, I, I need this level of pay and this is what I think is reasonable. Um, uh, and uh you don't have to be too overt about it. You don't say, oh, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, walk out." But you know, you can use language like, "You know, this is important to me. It's a problem. It, you know, for my life. If I haven't got the right level of pay, and you know, that's code for saying I'm gonna get another job." You know, um, but you're right. It does depend on where where the business is in its growth phase and whether the individual is bought into the vision of that business. But if it's a big yeah. business that's making lots of money, then, you know, frankly, I would say you're being robbed if you're not getting the right market value for your, for your job. Hey everyone, Nolan here. I have to jump in and end today's podcast for part A of the show. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. And also join us next week for part B of this awesome interview. Hey, thanks for checking out this video on Negotiate X TV. If you found any value at all, please hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification icon if you want to be notified of future videos. And then we also have a couple videos over here that you might be interested in checking out. If you and your small business, your team are looking to get negotiations or leadership training, then you can head over to NegotiateX.com and learn more about the coaching services we offer. Thanks, and I'll see you over in the next video.